What a great morning, because we have a great God. We are studying the book of Jonah on Sunday mornings, and before I begin, if you'd like an outline, you didn't get one, feel free to raise your hand, and the ushers would be happy to give you one, or if you'd like to borrow one of our Bibles, you're welcome to do that. When God called Jonah to leave his home and ministry in Israel and go to the pagan Assyrian city of Nineveh, who are the sworn enemies of Israel and preach against it, Jonah, as you remember, took off in a ship going in the opposite direction. Now, let's see what happened next by review, and we'll look at Jonah chapter 1, verses 4 to 16 today. If you want to follow along, Jonah 1. Beginning verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship and laid down and fallen asleep. So the captain approached him and said, how is it that you're sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us and we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, come, let's cast lots to learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, tell us now on whose account Has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? From what people are you? He said to them, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Well, then the men became extremely frightened and said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he told them. And they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, nevertheless, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not. For the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly and offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So we talked about last week the storm brought together Jonah and these unbelieving pagan Gentiles whom he despised. Jonah, up to this point, still has not said one word to God, not prayed at all. He's hiding from God. But this unusual storm brought the pagan Gentile sailors to their knees in a prayer to their gods. And they rebuked Jonah for not praying and calling on his God for them. Today we're going to look at uh, the religion of the sailors and the repentance of Jonah in their search for salvation. And we're going to contrast Jonah's worldview with the sailors' worldview, hopefully pick up a few things that can help us. In the process, we may see ourselves in the story, better understand the people we're trying to reach with the gospel. First, we'll look at the religion of the sailors. Then we'll look at the repentance of Jonah. The first thing that the religion of the sailors teaches us is that everyone is a worshiper. When the storm came, every man cried to his God. Jonah 1.5, the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God. They weren't asked to. They instinctively knew to do it. Everyone worships something. This passage is just confirming what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1. Let me read it. That which is known about God, the Creator, in other words, is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. 
Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So they're without excuse. For even though they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks. They became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and a bird's four-footed animals. Notice, they didn't stop believing in a God, they just changed gods. That's all. (laughs) The same true today. Everyone, whether they admit it or not, has a deep spiritual longing within. God put it there. We all have some sort of overarching religious goal or purpose that gives us meaning in life. We're not like animals who just get up every day and do what's there. Even though some of you may feel like it. We have to have something bigger than us to live for. And whatever that something is, that is our, the object we worship. So I'm going to get a, maybe a little convicting today for all of us, myself included, If we do not believe in the, or worship the true God, the living God, our creator, we will, we will, we can't help it, we'll end up worshiping other things. We'll give our life to other things. Things that are part of creation, but not the creator. Every human being, this, I'm telling you, you see it here in Jonah, you see it in in the New Testament, every human being is deeply religious regardless of what they may think or claim. But according to Romans 1, you know what happened? Our religion and our, our worship is distorted in our natural, unbelieving state. We will worship, or in other words, serve or give our life to created things instead of our creator. For example, some people may walk around and say, my life's in ruins, and it's because so-and-so didn't love me, or so-and-so betrayed me, or so-and-so hurt me. My life's in ruins. That is a religious statement. What are they saying? (laughs) They're saying, I've lost my meaning and purpose. If I can't have that, i got no purpose. That's worship. That's religion. The object I need, I have, I long for. That. Or I won't be happy. I won't be fulfilled. Some people's religion is their work or their career. They strive to serve the God of success. Because that's going to make them feel great and fulfilled. Success gives them meaning. And I could could list a whole host of other gods in our culture. In Jonah's boat, every man cried to his God. They all had a God. Everybody has a religion. We all look to something, something apart from us, to give us purpose and meaning in life. Be careful. If that's not the creator, we're in trouble. We'll worship something, even though it's bad. We can't help it. We're designed that way. He put it within us to worship. Now, when you look at the sailors' religion, it's very doubtful that the sailors were all the same, all equally religious in their devotion the beliefs and practice, very unlikely. They didn't serve different gods. Maybe they served, probably didn't regularly serve any god, but now they are. <laughs> you see, in extreme conditions, they all got very religious. We do the same thing. Jonah 1.5, every man cried to his god. Every single one of them. I call this the prayer of terror. In extreme conditions, our deeply buried religious nature 
will come out. It's there. We'll cry out to whatever God we've got or we think will hear us in our desperate, extreme situation. Now we need God. But if you want to understand an unbeliever's worldview and their religion, all you got to do is look at the sailors. All religions, apart from Jesus Christ, and unless the Holy Spirit enters a person's heart, all religions are religions of fear. These sailors are terrified, and that's the reason they cry out to their gods. What do they have to do to make this God happy? Or make their gods happy? The sailors panic and pray foxhole prayers to their gods. If you look at the sailors at the beginning of the chapter, they're crying out to their gods, but at the end of the chapter, they're crying out to Yahweh alone. Jonah's God, the true God. And yet, verse 14, they're still scared out of their minds. Fear. Then they called on Yahweh. That's literally what it said. We translate the Lord, but it's Yahweh. They called on Yahweh and said, We earnestly pray, O Yahweh, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Don't halt, put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. The sailors wonder if Yahweh's going to get them for what they're going to do. They're living in fear of all gods. The sailors are not speaking to Yahweh as a God they trust. They're not speaking to Yahweh as their heavenly father. They have no confidence that the gods they serve love them at all. Their whole life is designed to appease and please the gods so the God doesn't do, do them harm and trouble. Tell us what you want from us. We'll offer all kinds of sacrifices. That's because the natural bent of the human heart knows there is a God, but is unwilling to trust him as far as we can throw him. That's our natural bent. The prayer of terror is a sign that you or a person has not experienced God's grace in your heart. It's a sign. Not really sure whether God loves you or you can trust Him. The prayer of terror reflects our natural religiosity when we begin to bargain with God. That's what the pagan cultures would do. We're going to bargain. What do you want? I'll give it to you. Please get, protect us. That's a pagan religion. Fear. Fear-based. I'll do whatever you want, God, wherever you are, if you get me out of this mess. Hmm. Becoming religious is many people's bargaining chip with God. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to become very religious. I'm going to start going to church more. I'm going to start reading my Bible more. I'm going to start praying more. If only you'll do this for me. Bargain. That's how you treat a boss or a landlord, not your heavenly father. Not your heavenly father. You see, the irony of the prayer of terror is that we say, Lord, I'm in trouble. I'll do anything you want if you help me. The only thing... The one thing that God asks, like the rich young ruler, come to him unconditionally, completely surrender to him, is the one thing we won't give him. We're keeping that. Give me something else I can do for you. (laughs) This teaches us, by the way, that everyone needs Jesus Christ. It's because of fear that the sailors and all religions apart from Christ are works-based religions. 
we do these works, then God will be pleased with me. <clears throat> you can't do enough works to please a holy, pure, eternal God, creator. You can't. You can't do it. We had our chance in the garden. We missed it. Joe Nutsi told the sailors what they needed to do. Trust it in his message, what he's telling them, and then do it. Throw Jonah in the storm of the sea. But if you look at the text, look at how the sailors responded. After hearing, here's, here's God's message to them through Jonah. Yep, we hear it. But their fear-based mentality of how to worship God, interrupts. Uh, And the next word, well, Jonah 1, 12 and 13, um, he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, the sea will become calm for you, for I know on account of me this great storm has come upon you. The next word, mark it, nevertheless. Hmm. The men rowed desperately to return to land. We're going to save you, Jonah. We'll save ourselves. Everybody grab an oar. You heard what he said, his message from Yahweh, throw him in. No. We don't want to be beholden to Yahweh for that. Grab your oar, my friend. We're going to go. So remember this. Nevertheless, I know what God said to do, the truth of his word. Nevertheless, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to strive myself, try to get myself out of this. Hmm. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what's in, <laughs> I think this, actually, you got to see a little bit of humor in this because... Ah. Nevertheless, or however, they rode desperately. Then they said, Lord, don't please, please, please don't hold this against us. And they started rowing. And uh, the storm just became stormier. They weren't going to be able to do it. You can't do it. You know what they're doing? Trusting their own efforts and abilities to save them. Get them out of the jam. They heard Yahweh's message. They heard exactly what to do. But nevertheless, I'm going to keep doing what I want to do to save myself. God showed me, you can't save yourself. We cling to fear People cling to fear because we can never please a false god. Never. Ever. (laughs) There's always more. So, let me challenge you today. We kind of all have our own personal oar. What are you doing? What oar have you grabbed that you've decided, well, I don't want God to... I don't know, I could ah, hack this out myself. Okay. See, if you don't believe in Jesus as your substitute, as Jonah was for the sailors, that means we've grabbed a metaphorical oar and think we're good enough, religious enough, powerful enough to save ourselves. And I'm not just talking eternal salvation. I'm talking about any salvation. (laughs) Now, in contrast to the sailor's worldview, let's look at Jonah's worldview. I want you to notice, uh, Jonah did not bargain with God. He put everything in his hands. I know what God wants. 
He wants me to go in that sea. He surrendered. He repented. He said, it's because of me. I'm the one who messed up. So I'm surrendering myself to God. Would you just, I got to put myself in his hands. Just throw me in the sea. Jonah's, in Jonah's worldview, he, he not only knew that the true God existed, he knew the true God, what he was like. As we'll see later in chapter 4, he recites the character of Yahweh, loving, compassionate. He knew that. He knew his God. Was no stranger to him. This is God's will. This is what he said. Throw me in. No bargains. I'm not going to try to say anything that's going to change his mind. I'm just going to surrender. You know, take a lesson. I think we can take a lesson from Jonah here. If you're a believer in Jesus, one of God's sons and daughters, and you're in a storm, you don't have to bargain with God. You can, but you don't have to. He's your heavenly father. You don't have to prove yourself worthy. You don't have to become more religious. Just love him. That's it. Love him back. If we follow Jonah's example, he humbled himself, he admitted his sin, he repented, and surrendered himself to God and his situation to God, to Yahweh. Follow it. Trust God to do what is right and good for you. And here's, and put yourself in Jonas, even if it means you have to die for your, to yourself even. Jonah knew this was the death penalty. <laughs> There's no physical way he's going to survive. He had to be, he had to surrender in Enough to God that he's given his life to him. Will you? No matter what happens. You trust him that much. That's what's at stake. That's the difference between the religion of the sailors and Jonah's. He knew his God and trusted him completely. The scriptures tell us, and it ta- you know, it really does for every one of us who is a believer in Jesus. I've noticed, I've been, I've been, you know, probably close to fifty years a Christian, and uh, believe me, it, it takes a lifetime to know your God, who can can convince you that He's trustworthy, He loves you. See, we start out in our natural state, kind of thinking it's still with us. I don't know if I trust him. Trust him with everything? (laughs) Suppose he takes it. So what? He's God. (laughs) And the scriptures say, and we learn this. He teaches us, patiently teaches us over time, throughout our life. He's a good God. He gives good gifts to his children. He hears us when we pray, but he knows the end from the beginning and knows what is best for us in any situation, no matter how hard it is. Do you have that confidence? Well, that's that's what you got to aim at. He will only give us what is in our best interest because more than any other God or created thing, he loves us infinitely. Through Jesus Christ. And his love is not dependence on our performance, but on Christ's performance. His love will never cease, and he will never fail you. That's who he is. How great is our God. Do you think you reflect more the religion of the sailors? Or Yahweh of Jonah. 
Are you grabbing for an oar? Or are you trusting your life in the hands of Almighty God who sent his son to die in your place so you could have life eternally? When our fear-based religious tendencies start to come up, and they will, they will, there's something in us that doesn't want to trust God as far as we can throw him, just like sailors. And we forget the truth. We lose our confidence. We begin responding in fear. We need to repent of that. Recognize it and repent of it. Say, dear Lord, I'm a mess. Help me to trust you. and Put my confidence in you, not in this situation. A hospital chaplain I know out on the east, in the east, Pennsylvania, was once called to visit a patient who wanted to talk to a chaplain about God. Uh, But interestingly, when he got to the patient's room, the man started to apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I don't need to talk to you. They mixed up my (laughs) x-rays. They told me my x-ray showed I have terminal cancer. When they told him I had Colonel Cassis, I, I told him I was not a religious person, but I still wanted to talk to somebody about God. But then, turned out the x-rays were for somebody else. True story. When he saw that he was going to be okay, he was sorry that he bothered the chaplain, and he didn't really want to talk about God now. He's going to be okay. In essence, this patient was admitting They only wanted to deal with God when he had to. When his life is not going the way he wanted it to. Oh, I need to deal with God. Some of you, you see, have hit a storm and are in trouble. Are you you bargaining with God or laying down your life and trusting him? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make straight your paths. Here's a question for you. How do you know that you're moving forward and trusting God and not in a manipulative way trying to bargain with God and living in fear? All you got to do is look what you do when you're out of trouble. Look what happens when you're not in trouble. Will you still pray regularly? Will you still read your Bible regularly? Will you still come to church regularly? Are you just using those as bargaining chips? Hopefully God will look with favor on you. That's how you tell. Do you fall back into being religious when it's convenient? Or your best interest? Somehow to appease God? Look on you differently? When the sailors finally believed and trusted Jonah's words uh, that the sea would be calm if they threw him in, they they threw him in. You need to realize, they they threw him in realizing they were sending him to his death. They had no other evidence to suggest otherwise. This was a death sentence. He, He rebelled against his God. Okay. As soon as they threw him in, the sea stopped cold. Hmm. Jonah one fifteen. they picked him up, threw him in the sea, the sea stopped its raging. Through Jonah's sacrifice for them, they believed and were saved. They feared Yahweh and worshipped him alone. Jonah one sixteen. the men feared the Lord greatly. They offered a sacrifice to Yahweh, made vows I think Jonah and Jesus have this in common. Just as Jonah gave his life to save the sailors, so Jesus gave his life to save us. Don't grab an oar. (laughs) By the way, speaking of the Jewish people, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10.3, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to, listen to this, seeking to establish their own righteousness, 
They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. The truth is, everyone is trying to establish their own righteousness of their own to prove we're not that bad. We're not as bad as that person. We're, we're worthy. We're superior to somebody. The more people we feel better than, the better we feel about ourselves. That's called self-righteousness. But our righteousness, the scripture tells us, always falls short of God and his righteousness. Realize only Jesus Christ lived a perfect life and was righteous before God. And when the sinless Christ submitted, substituted himself for us by dying on the cross for our sins, God gives Jesus' perfect righteousness to everyone who believes in him. We don't have to prove ourselves worthy anymore. You know why? Because Jesus is worthy on our behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Jesus, him who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As Jonah figured out, and may take us a while to figure out, there is no refuge from God. None. Zero. There is only refuge in God, in him, through faith in his son. Just like what Jonah was for the sailors, Jesus is for us. Our substitute thrown into the storm of God's wrath for us. And you know what? After he did that, in every person who believes in him, the storm of God's wrath for our sin quiets down to nothing. No condemnation whatsoever. Is God great? I'm telling you, Jesus, <laughs> what he did for us, we should never doubt. Our Heavenly Father, who welcomes us into his family in intimacy with him through the Holy Spirit. Jonah was assigned to go to the Ninevites. Jesus was assigned to go to his generation. And you know what he said to them? You know what? Behold, a greater than Jonah is here. <laughs> Believe in him for salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message of the gospel of Christ, which you promised to give forgiveness of sins and eternal life to all who believe in Jesus as their Savior. And we thank you for Jesus, who became our substitute, enduring your wrath for our sins. The death penalty was on us, and he went in to save us. Would you please help us to lay down our oars, trusting in our own efforts to save ourselves or to gain your approval through all the good things we do. Help us to trust only in Jesus, his righteousness, and in your kindness, your faithfulness by faith. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.